In April of 1890, Crowfoot, great hunter, brave warrior, and eloquent spokesman of the Blackfoot Confederacy, lay dying. He spoke. What is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the wintertime. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset.
As man's civilization develops, it presses itself into crowded urban centers and struggles for elbow room, quiet, private moments. with his bulldozer and dredge. Jungles of housing developments, shopping centers, and industrial parks sprout where forests of trees once stood. Rivers filled with soil eroded from their naked banks. Water project planners design dams to the inch, and compute water volumes to be stored and released to the cubic foot. They calculate benefit-cost ratios to the fourth decimal, considering power to be generated, land to be irrigated, or floods to be controlled. Unfortunately, fish and wildlife gains or losses are more difficult to express. how steelhead survive nitrogen supersaturation and how salmon leap dams to reach spawning areas. for salmon, redesigned spillways to preserve fish life, he plans bigger developments which may pose different environmental dilemmas.
light his cities, generate power for factories, transportation vehicles, and home conveniences. To make his living, man has dammed Earth's waters, built power and industrial plants, strung endless miles of electrical wires, mined coal, and pumped oil from the Earth. At what cost to the natural world? Electrocutions and unintentional trapping contribute to the steady decline of the bald eagle, America's national symbol. Ducks can't differentiate between potholes and oil sludge pits. toll from diseases like duck viral enteritis seems sufficient. Today, when the American farmer can realize inflated profits from the crops he has paid inflated dollars to produce, how easily he begrudges the percentage lost to migratory birds. Vicious farmer sprays his fields with pesticides. Who educates him to the loss he suffers when pelicans and ospreys, unable to reproduce after ingesting his poison, disappear from earth? And is the pesticide spraying farmer any less responsible than the industrialist who, in his eagerness to produce a stronger fiber, pumps his poison waste directly into stream, air, and sea? As the world demands more food, the pressure to cultivate wild land increases. The Dakota farmer eyes the waterfowl breeding potholes of his land and envisions drainage projects. If his marshlands can be drained and converted to cereal grain acres, he may clear record dollar profits. Land use priorities now are complex. Food and fiber must be produced but land overgrazed by cattle, allowed to roam at will, cannot support wildlife, nor can it continue to nourish domestic herds. Humankind, too, unable to thrive on bread alone, 
seeks out the places left to it for solitude and recreation. This land must also be maintained. Across much of the land in the West, the resourceful coyote has stirred heated controversy. The coyote has become the central figure in a classic protectionist economic struggle. While it deals with the ecological effects of urban sprawl and environmental degradation, as it undertakes predator control and the solutions to problems created by zealous developers, the Fish and Wildlife Service also faces its critics. One of the most articulate, author Cleveland Amory, president of the Fund for Animals. Hunters hide behind uh, the word conservation. The hunters in turn say, we hide behind the word conservation and aren't really conservatives at all because we don't put the money out there to raise more ducks or whatever it is they want to shoot more of. I think my book is a very thorough and convincing argument that game management as practiced today in the United States of America is a cruel fraud on anybody who isn't a member of the National Rifle Association or an active hunter. On him, maybe it's even a cruel fraud on him. Uh, if there is anything in game starving, uh, why do they have uh, animals they shoot all year long? Uh, the figures are pretty staggering. How many morning doves are shot? 50 million, 60 million, 40 million? What does it matter? One year that broken bodies of those little guys would make a trail from New York to Los Angeles and back to Chicago. And those were the ones killed. My book talks a lot about the ones wounded, like that wonderful bow hunting. Now, I don't mean that hunters didn't start bow hunting because they wanted to give the animals a better shake. They did, but it didn't work out that way. Read about Mississippi and bow hunting. Read why they, why they had to go to what amounts to a poison arrow in Mississippi, because there was a damn many wounded animals in the woods, that's why. Read that part. What nonsense on the National Resources Council the Audubon Society votes in, and the others vote in, what, the Shikar Safari Group and keep out us? I mean, who are you kidding? In the first place, the National Resources Council didn't mind a shuck of pins. We had a more important meeting at Marlon Perkins's Wildlife Sanctuary. There were a lot of different opinions represented there. Marlon Perkins' opinion isn't the same as mine about hunting. But we, we have a lot of people there. We had Sierra there. We had Animal Protection Institute. We had Wilderness Society, we had ourselves, we had the International Fund for Animal Welfare. We had an awful lot of people there. Uh, I think you better consider a total reorganization of the, uh, whatever they call the National Resources Council. Now let's talk turkey, if I can use one of your expressions. You know, sure shooting, square shooter. Shoot, fire away. We gotta even change the language. You pig, you weasel, you skunk, you jackass. Finally, if the National Rifle Association insists to the very end that the slaughter of animals is basic to its cause concerning the right to bear arms, then that cause or that organization or both must go. Somehow I believe the country will survive the privation. 
state laws against cruelty to animals must be applied to wild animals as they were originally intended to do, and they must be upheld by the courts. Fish and game departments must be reconstituted so that the non-hunter not, be not only represented, but represented in the numbers his numbers warrant. State conservation and natural resources commissions must be totally reorganized. The federal government's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must be in reality a service. A service to whom? To the public, to the non-hunting public, as well as the hunting public. It has taught the whole world game management, and now it must get out of the game and unteach the management. The Fish and Wildlife Service confronts issues fundamental to the nation's environmental dilemma. Amidst the internal policy controversies, the administrative tangles, the vocal outrage of its critics, the service looks to the future, knowing that new problems will develop, old ones linger, and that wise solutions will be difficult. Its decisions and commitments will affect generations yet unborn. The challenge is great. The responsibility, awesome. The opportunities, limitless. Thank you.